I'd like you to try to imagine with me two different scenarios. In the first one, you're wandering through a cold, dark forest. And it's like, it's raining and it's kind of snowing. That kind of the worst sort of combination of weather you can have where it's really cold and wet and it's not quite nice snow you can play in. It's just miserable and it's dark and you're lost at this time. You've been there for quite a while and you're starting to despair that you might never be able to make it out of this forest. You don't know which way to go and so you sort of just keep wandering around aimlessly hoping that you can find your way. Eventually you stumble upon a path, but like most paths look from the middle, you can go to the right or to the left. And you're not sure which way you should go. You enter the forest on this path, but one way is going to take you deeper into the forest where you'll for sure be hopelessly lost, while the other direction will probably lead you out, but you don't know which is which. So you decide to sit down by a tree near this path, and you're going to sit and contemplate which direction you should go. That's our first person. Now our second person is in the same forest, in the same cold and dark forest, with the same weather conditions, on the same night, in fact. And this person is actually not wandering through the forest. This person is running an ultra marathon, in fact. They're 50 miles in, and they've got about 50 miles to go. Right now, if you're running this ultra marathon, your legs are burning, your lungs are burning, pretty much every single muscle in your body will hurt at mile 50. You've got what you need to continue the race, and you know that you can make it. You've already done half of it. That's the hardest part. So you're going to continue on running. You've got the water you need. You have the calories you need. You have your lights. But it's the middle of the night, and you'd really like to stop. But you're aiming to win this race, so you're going to press on. You're going to continue going step after step. And that's how you're going to continue through this forest and make it to the finish line. Now, the difference with you and this other person, the primary difference is that you have a finish line that you're going for, where the other person doesn't even know that there's an end to the forest. You have a finish line that you know is going to be warm food at. You know that your friends and family are going to be there to congratulate you on a race well run. The other person thinks that they might die in this forest. Let's read Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that is set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now keep our two people in mind that we thought about a second ago, because I think they're a fitting allegory for this passage, and I'm going to reference them often throughout this sermon. This passage here, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, is one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and I think it's really a message of hope for us. It's a way of life. It's a higher purpose. It's a calling that we can live by. And there's so much good advice packed into these two short verses, and I'd like to go through them with you and share what I see in these verses and hopefully encourage you. So first off, starting in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, who is this cloud of witnesses? They're the people who have run the race that we're running before us. We know this race can be completed. We have the confidence we can get to the finish line. And why? Well, because this race has been running for years and years, and other people have completed it, sometimes in far worse conditions than we have. Sometimes there was snow on the ground so deep you could barely continue on. Sometimes parts of the path have been washed away and you don't know where you go from there. But these other people, they have completed the race in these various difficult conditions. And so you know that you can complete the race too this night. That cloud of witnesses, those people who have completed the race before us, are some of them are shown in chapter 11 of Hebrews, right before chapter 12. Abel, by faith Abel, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not as yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. We see Abraham and Sarah mentioned, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses' parents, and Moses, Joshua and Rahab, and then the writer of Hebrews talks about many other heroes of faith. We can, we, can take, we can take heart in this race that is life that we're living because others have gone through this race before us and been successful and made it to that finish line, made it to that goal where you have rest. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. This race that we're on, it's a long one that we're running. We don't want to have extra weight with us. 
We want to lay aside everything that we don't specifically need to survive through this race. And how do we do that? And why do we do that? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church, and he's telling them how they should serve the Lord. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. We're called to run in this race. We're called to serve Christ in such a way that we win the race. We're not here for a participation trophy. We're here to get first place. We need to run in such a way as to win. And in order to do that, we need to lay aside all these weights and the sins which beset us. Now, the sins that beset us, those are the easy part, right? There's things that are in direct opposition to God, things that will very obviously pull us away from God in our walk with him. But then there's this other part that the writer of Hebrews mentioned here, the weights. It's not necessarily a sin, but if you put your focus on these other things, they can draw you away from God. David knows this, and David in Psalms 19 prays to God and asks him to remove hidden sins from his life. Let's turn to Psalms 19 and read that. Psalms 19, starting in verse 12. Starting in verse 12, David says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. David knows that he's not going to be able to find all the different sins in his life alone. So he calls out to God and asks God to help him to find these secret faults, uncover these sins in his life so that he can live a life closer to God. And this doesn't only help us. When we are able to remove the, the hidden sins and the weights in our lives, we're able to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. In Matthew, Jesus talks about removing the beam from your eye first before you attempt to remove the moat from your brother's eye. There's all these different things clouding our vision. And if we can't remove them, it's difficult for us to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we should constantly be delving into our lives and trying to understand what habits we have that are pulling us away from Christ, what speech we have that's pulling us away from Christ, what are our actions that might be pulling us or our brothers and sisters in Christ away from our walk with God. We need to constantly be searching ourselves and praying and asking God for the wisdom to be able to make our lives as efficient as possible in our run to Christ. And how do we do this? How do we decipher for ourselves which of our habits and which of our words and which of our thoughts are something that would lead us away from Christ. Well, there's plenty of places in God's word that we could turn to to help us decipher exactly what we should do in order, to, in order to know what things we should pull out of our lives. And I think David puts it well in Psalms 119, verse 11. He says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In order to know what we should pull out of our lives, we need to know the heart of God. And to do that, we have to be in his word daily. This book that we have here shows us everything we need to live a life, the life that God has called us to live. But in order to live that life, we need to know what it says. So we should be reading God's word daily and writing it on our hearts so that we can understand how to lay aside the weights and the sins which so easily beset us. And we should run with patience the race that is set before us. This race is a long race, like we talked about earlier. You can't run it all at once. You need to be patient. There's going to be many trials and tribulations along the way. And unfortunately, patience isn't a virtue that you can just get more of. In order to get patience, you need to suffer through various trials and tribulations with grace and with joy. James talks about this in James chapter 1 and verse 2. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We need to allow ourselves to go through different trials and tribulations, and we need to suffer those with grace and with peace and with joy so that we can build that patience that will help us to run this race with endurance. If you get too tired too early, if you go out too hard, it's really difficult to recover from that. So we need to be patient 
We need to make sure that we're pacing ourselves. You can't expect to start implementing changes in your life and have them take effect immediately. Uh, you need to have patience to allow those changes to really work the work that you are hoping to have. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So we have this, this perfect example, somebody who, who actually designed the course that we're currently running, and he finished it too, and he did a perfect job of it. In Matthew 5 and verse 48, Jesus says, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now that's an unattainable goal. None of us are ever going to be perfect. None of us ever can be perfect but it's a little bit of a reference point that we can measure our actions from. If we have this perfect that we can look at, then we can direct our steps to try to be walking in a direction that leads us towards perfect, because that's where the finish line ultimately is. And again, in order to do that, we need to constantly be in God's word, because that is where we find what Jesus's will is, and we can understand how to be perfect, like the Heavenly Father is perfect. If we're not constantly in his word, We'll never be able to be perfect, and we won't even really know what that means. Furthermore, in Matthew uh, chapter 14, starting in verse 26, we see an excellent example of Peter keeping his eyes on Jesus and what happens when he takes them off. So starting in verse 26, we see Jesus walking across the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straight away Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? It's really easy for us in our walk with Christ to get distracted by all of the trials and tribulations, all the cares of this world that we might currently be involved with. But if we are able to keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll be able to stay above the waves and above all these trials. However, as soon as we take our eyes off of Jesus, that's when we begin to sink. And this will happen from time to time. We'll stumble and fall. But fortunately, we serve a gracious God and as soon as we cry unto him and say, Lord, save us, he will immediately reach forth his hand and pull us from the waves. So let's look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's a really important part of this passage here that I, I really don't see anywhere else in the Bible. It says that Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. Now, I think the writer of Hebrews is trying to make a very important point here, and that is that even though Jesus was God incarnate, the cross was not an easy sacrifice for him. This wasn't something that was just a walk in the park because he was God. This was still something that was incredibly difficult for him to go through. He despised the shame and he endured the cross. But he did that for the joy that was set before him. That joy being him being set down at the right hand of the throne of God and us being able to be with him in heaven one day. We too should endure any trials and tribulations in our lives in a similar manner. All right, if we look to Romans 8, starting in verse 16, we'll see Paul talking about enduring trials, about the trials and tribulations that we might experience in this life. Romans 8, starting in verse 16. He says, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, that we may suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So it's a good way to temper the sufferings that we might be experiencing in our life, because we can have a confidence that anything that we're going through now is not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. It's nothing compared to what we have to experience when we get to heaven with Christ. 
I think it just, it really gives a lot of peace to know that you have nothing to worry about. You've got a God there who's willing to pull you out of the waters whenever you sink. And you've got a glory waiting for you that's so immense that it makes the sufferings of this current day worth nothing in compared to them. And then further, Jesus is set down at the right hand of the throne of God now. Now, we don't have the privilege of being set down at the right hand of the throne of God, but we have something very similar to look to. Paul, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he knew that his time was nearing an end. He was going to die soon. And he writes to Timothy and he says, For now I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto all them that love his appearing. Paul had a confidence that he had run his course with patience, that he had fought the good fight, that he had finished the race. And he knew that there was a crown that was laid up in store for him in heaven, and not just him, but unto everyone else that loves Christ's appearing, to everyone who runs the race with him. Let's think back to our two people in the forest. The first person is again sitting by the tree, still pondering which direction he should go. And he looks to his right, and he sees a light bobbing up and down, coming up the path towards him. And he thinks, oh, maybe that's a person. And eventually, the sight comes into more clarity, and he sees that it is indeed a person running down the path with the light. And he, he's not willing to cry out to ask the person for help, because that would mean that he would have to admit that he's lost. And he's a prideful man, and so he won't admit that he's lost. But he hopes the person will stop and ask him if he needs help. You're running down the path and you look to your left and you see this man seated by a tree and he looks at you with hope in his eyes and you ask him are you lost do you know where you're at and he says no i've been i've been wandering this forest for quite a few days now and i'm you know i thought that i might never see another person again and you say well i know the way out it's just this way we're 25 miles away from the finish line if you follow me we'll get there and they have warm food and shelter and they can bandage up your cuts and your bruises and that man by the tree was just hoping for that good news. So he gets up and he follows the runner down the path. That's our ultimate goal in life, is to take this message of hope that we have here, that we have a cloud of witnesses, that there is someone who has run this race before us, that we have a perfect example to follow along with. That's our goal, is to share this message with the one sitting by the path, hoping to find a way out. And that's exactly the last words that Jesus left us with, in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. He says, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. We have this awesome message of hope. This, this message that, that tells people that the life that we're living, the hardships that we're going through, they're not meaningless. Their trials and tribulations that will help temper our patience and make us into better people. But that only really works if you have a goal in mind. I couldn't imagine living my life without uh, the thought that I have something higher to strive for. It would be really difficult to go through any kind of trouble with the thought that this is just happening for no particular reason. But if I know that I have a God that I'm serving and that these trials and tribulations are, are thrown at me by the enemy or just by evil people in the world, it makes it so much easier to continue on. It gives us a purpose. And we have this beautiful higher purpose and this good news that we can share with all those around us. So as we're running through this forest, as we're continuing on our, in our race, if we see those by the wayside that look like they need help, we need to ensure that we're stopping to offer them help, to tell them the good news, to show them the way. So this evening, if you feel that you've been running your race, but you might have fallen off the path and you'd like to get back on, but you need some pointers, or if you've never started your race and you need help, you need someone to point you in the correct direction down the path, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. We'd love to be able to help you. We'd love to be able to talk to you about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gives us this glorious purpose that we have. So if you have any need, please come forward while we stand and sing.